Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin, and I've got the pleasure to speak to Greg Wolfen from SecureKey Technologies Inc. Greg, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Tony, for having me. So, Greg, my first question is: How do I know I'm speaking to the real Greg Wolfen? <laughs> is it me or not? I mean, that's that's the ever increasing problem, right? People people talk about this thing called digital ID. But the reality in this day and time is we don't know someone is who they say they are, right? They have a driver's license that says it's Greg, uh, or they can answer questions like Greg's mother's maiden name and things like that. But yeah. we're living in this era where 5 billion records are stolen, where the bad guys know social security numbers, no answers to questions, hmm. often better than the customer does. So how do you detect whether it's online, whether it's in a call center, or even in person, Am I really speaking to the real Greg Wolfman? That's, that's the challenge we're facing. Absolutely. And, and we'll get into what your com how your company has solved for that. But first, I want to ask you, I mean, you're a serial entrepreneur. Um, how did you get into identity in the first place? I think we started SecureKey in the first place. I had a, a good friend and a cousin who both had mortgages put on their homes. And it wasn't done by them. It was done by a fraudster who just took over their identity, realized they had a low ratio, and basically went into a bank, said they were them, put yeah. a loan. And then it was years to fight this thing off and get it fixed. And so there has to be a better way to go solve this. So we were years of trying to figure out, you know, can I use biometrics? Can I use knowledge based stuff? What can I use to actually help people prove it's them and not yeah. let a bad person take advantage of people that way? And, and when you were building the company, um, how were you approaching it? Were you coming at it from the perspective that you had a, uh, you thought you had a technology solution or you thought you had a business model solution. How did it kind of gel to um, actually come together into a business proposition, which is now very successful? Yeah, I think we started with the, the problem statement. The problem is we, how do we know it's really you and how do I get through here, right? Like we have lots of services, you know, in places like the U.S. where you can log into the IRS or places like Canada, you can log into government. But places like that that you log into, it's once a year. So do you remember your uppercase, lowercase, number, letter, password? Yeah. You don't. So the bad guy who knows your social security number can go in and prove it's you, pretend they're you, and then get a, get a tax refund and then disappear mm. with the money. And then you have to go fight that out and fix it. So we thought, there's got to be a way to make it safer. And so we were kind of incremental in it. In Canada, we started with, hey, if I could just log into government instead of creating a new password, use my bank login. Yes. to see my taxes, to see my benefits, to get social insurance kind of stuff, that would make it a lot safer because I get all the security of the national banks that are checking the mm -hmm. device you're on, the location you're at, all those things, as opposed to this password that I'm not going to remember when I go there. And we started that you know, a little over 10 years ago. Yeah. And we now have you know, 15 million Canadians. There's not that many adult Canadians who are filing taxes using the services and they love it. Okay, so the, so the first use case was um, using your bank logon to access government services. Um, and recently that concept has been massively expanded. Uh, you, you in Canada have launched the Verified Me Scheme, which is a, more of a fully fledged federated bank ID scheme. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what your role has been? Yeah, it's very, it's very much like bank. Like we think the problem is this. The problem is when I'm signing up for a new service, can I prove it's really Greg? When I'm signing in for a service, I may choose a password from that service, but I may want to use one that's trusted that I already have, like my bank. And when I want to step up my auth, I'm not sure, the bank isn't really sure it's me, and now I'm going for a $500,000 mortgage. Hmm. Hey, can you scan your passport? Can you do other things to prove it's really you? So this whole idea of sign up, sign in, step up is what we're trying to do. So the, the, the first service we did did the sign in piece. This new service called Verified Me kind of covers the gamut. So I could show up. Uh, at Royal Bank to create a new bank account and they're not sure who I am. So they can say, hey, Greg, do you have an account at one of these banks? And I mm -hmm. log in at TD Bank and TD shares, this is Greg Wolfond, born on this birth date, has had an account for 15 years, logged in right now. So we share that with the consumer's consent to Royal Bank, but we also share, um, Greg, are you willing to share it's coming from your cell phone and the cell phone's at your house and it's actually your cell phone that you've had for a period of time. Yeah. You, know, you want to share from Equifax that you're not a fraudster and you're not on these lists and the rest. So hmm. all of a sudden with a single consent by the user, I can share from TD Bank, from Rogers and from Equifax, that I'm a good person. And they can say, yep, hey, Greg, you're approved for that loan in an instant with a very high degree of surety that it's really me. So passing and surpassing all the FinTrack bars and everything else, yeah. but really being sure that it's me. Um, so, Greg, we've seen countries following different paths in the rollout of digital identity infrastructure. I mean, at one extreme, you have India with the um, government Aadhaar scheme where everyone is, is enrolled in that scheme and it's mandatory. 
Um, yeah. Then we have these uh, bank ID schemes in the Nordics and now it sounds like in Canada. And, you know, most recently we've had these ideas about self-sovereign ID where essentially you're, you're your own kind of custodian of those credentials. Um, do you, how, how do you see the interplay of these models? And, and also I'm very interested in whether you think these digital ID schemes should be somehow mandated? Yeah, so at the end of the day, it's up to the relying party to, to, to what do I trust or what don't I trust? The bank mm. ID schemes in the Nordic countries work really well because it's government and bank working together. The stuff that we're doing in Canada, it, it's just kind of a, an, an evolution on top of that because it's not, we don't see it as just sharing my tombstone data, my name, address, date of birth. If I want to be able to share to a lender uh, that I'm Greg Wolfon, that Equifax says my credit is this, that here's a background check on Greg and, and I've done a full background check because I'm renting an apartment. Our view is the consumer should be able to consent and release data that they have at different parties to the rolling party. And that's what makes business process get better. So if I'm getting a mortgage, can I show up at a bank to get a mortgage and I can release from the tax authority, here's Greg's records for the last two years yeah. for his income. And I can release from another bank, this is really Greg, and from Equifax, here's his credit. It starts to streamline those processes and make the consumer journey that much better as you add more. So our, our yeah. view is this combination of security factors, what I have, my cell phone, what I know, my bank login, what I am, matching driver's license, passport, things like that that we do. And depending on the use case, a relying party will choose as many of those or as few of those as they need to satisfy their need. Then you can go across. And then the mechanism, so you say, how the interrupt mechanism you asked before is, um, we think in the end, this is going to move towards standards, right? Mm -hmm. So Microsoft is pushing quite hard on a standard called DIFF. Um, everyone's pushing quite hard on this verifiable credential piece. I think it moves towards things called verifiable credentials. Yes. So that I, the consumer should be in control. They should be able to consent to share, but having more levers to share that, that, that I've logged in at my bank, that I've checked my driver's license, that I've checked the phone it was onboarded in. We think that's going to make it more secure because we think the bad guys are out there. Yeah. Some people talk digital ID. I can just take my driver's license out, scan the front, scan the back, scan my face. And that must be Greg. And we, th we just think the fraudsters are going to go to town on that, right? It's just, no. there's too many databases with passports. You know, for a few dollars, you can buy a passport image. Here's the full image. And here's the face with liveness mm. uh, to say it's Tony. It's like, oh my yeah. God. So, but if I can check the other factors, this was loaded on Tony's phone and it was loaded at Tony's house and he can log into Tony's bank. If yeah. you're giving a half million dollar mortgage, you need to know this stuff. And so our view is just pragmatic that multiple levers are going to make it better but these things have to interrupt, right? So open ID is a big one that it interrupts on. It has to be, you know, meet those standards, the verifiable credential standard that's coming from mm -hmm. WPC uh, has to work. Um, and these things will come together. They will start yeah. to interrupt. Right? What I'm fascinated by, uh, you almost paint this picture of, um, you know, in, in, in Europe and in many parts of the world, we are talking about open banking, um, which is, you know, banks opening up APIs and then with consent sharing up with third parties. But you actually, in your description there, are painted a much larger picture, not only of open banking, but almost like an open uh, data society where if you get a customer consent, um, you can share that data with any third party that you choose to wish, backed by a strong customer authentication. So... I think what's kind of fascinating is that open banking in Europe started in an environment where we didn't really have a digital ID infrastructure. In Canada, you're starting with a digital ID. So do you think that open banking, open data, the journey will be easier in Canada than it has been in Europe? Yeah, I think you can't really do open anything without good, you know, who is this person who's agreeing to share? Yeah, right? if and a strong consent. A strong thing, but, you, but your view that talk about open data, is brilliant. Like that's, that's what we think this is to really solve a business problem. If I'm trying to rent an apartment, mm. what does the landlord care about? Do they care about my name? They, they no. don't really, they care about is my credit over X is my income over Y. Uh, and do I have a background check to make sure I'm okay. And if I can do those three things and do it in seconds, then yeah. instead of paying uh, a real estate agent one month's rent, which could be thousands of dollars, I can pay $10 and onboard my tenant like that. Yeah. Right. So all of a sudden, and re-engineer all of these processes and the consumer is consenting. So I'm going to feel much better about consenting to share my data in the place I want it. And do you also subscribe to this idea of um, 
you know, not handing over your full ID information. You're just handing, you're just like verifying claims. Like, um, you know, if, if I need to check into a hotel, I don't need to necessarily hand over my passport to get my full information. Someone just needs to verify that I am who I say I am. Yeah, I, I believe absolutely minimal data should be shared at each time. So if I'm going into a bar, yeah. I should be able to prove I'm over the legal age of 21 or 18, depending absolutely. on the place I am. If I'm going into a healthcare provider, I should be able to share my health card number. In mm. Canada, I shouldn't share my health card number with the bar. Yeah. So some of the challenges with these other approaches, um, like the self-sovereign software now, trust over IP, is we have a governance structure we believe that is important because you want to know who you're giving that data to. I don't want a bad party to come into the network and start requesting data, and it's not who they're supposed to be. So the rules around who can request what data, who provides what data, what's the liability model? Yes. That stuff becomes really important as well because you know it's the banks who are participating here, they want to know the data is going to trusted parties. They don't want yeah. fraud yeah. coming in and requesting all this data and then pulling it through. And so you got, you got to be careful on both ends of this piece. So that's where I think they come together. The, the balance yeah. of um, governance of the network, who, who's allowed to come in, what things can different parties request, I think is really important. And we're learning that as we go along. Now, now, one of the, you also mentioned the keyboard there, which is liability. And, uh, you know, some identity infrastructures or, or uh, proposals which have come up in the past have really stumbled on this, on this topic of liability. I believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm exposing my ignorance here, yeah. that the scheme in Canada is built upon a, a no liability model. Am I correct? And maybe you can tell me how it's really working. Yeah, the, the, there's never none. You have to be able to protect against what it is. But generally, we want the requesting party to request what it needs. If yeah. Royal Bank says this is Greg Wolfon, they're going to say it's Greg. But to the best of the ability in the process that they run, they're going to say that it's Greg. Um, if you want more, re request more. I want to know from the telecom provider that this person has Greg Wolfon's phone. Yeah. I want to know from the province of Ontario that he matched Greg's driver's license and matched the face and liveness. And I want to check to make sure it's issued right now. Yeah. But uh, is it up to me? So you, you can choose the different parts you want. And the more things you request, the more it costs. But the goal is to keep it low cost because the providers, like the institutions providing in here are also the users and they want yeah. it low cost because they want to make it better for themselves, but they also want to make it better for their customers who are I going see. up to places and want to be safer. So what, what you're saying is that in a sense then, as a relying party, it's kind of up to me to request the information that I think I need to fulfill my own requirements. And are you also saying therefore that if you kind of like layer on too much of a heavy liability structure, it will blow the cost structure out of the water? It's just, it's just too different. People would like to have it. I think there's a model that it could be there and we could charge more for it and have an insurance component built in yeah. be or cost, cost a little bit more, but have insurance with it. Like we can do that for sure. And in some geographies, we're talking to providers who'd like to use this and then layer insurance on top. Yeah. But reality is today, it is the relying party that takes the risk. When I walk into a bank and show my driver's license, there's no liability back to the province for that license, right? If I show a copy of a hydro bill, there's no liability back to the hydro company for that. Yeah. And so why would we create something artificial that's different? Yeah, no, it's, a key, it's a key point. It's super interesting. And, and what I'd like to he hear about also is you've had great success in Canada. Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about your efforts to spread the word in other countries. And in particular, I'm always fascinated by um, the identity infrastructure, if you can call it an identity infrastructure in the United States, um, yeah. you know, what's going on there. I know that there is a kind of um, up tiering taking place in terms of uh, driving licenses and what you have to show at airports. Um, but how, how do you see things developing in other countries and in particular in the US? Yeah, so the US we have, we can't talk specifically about the names in it now. We have a massive project going in the US to bring this online. Sure. We also have a project which is public with Homeland Security where we're showing how we do verifiable credentials, how we load the green card, can show up at a party and show that I actually have the green card in my wallet and it's a real government issued document. And yeah. so interoperability between four or five different vendors being able to share that credential and go back and forth. So they're doing some great work there. So I think they're kind of leading in the, in the idea this has to be open. I can't have vendor lock. I've got to be able to share across. Yes. And we're kind of leading in the fact that you need governance, you need to protect the parties and make sure people are safe enough when they use these things. Yeah. But there is no question that with technology, I can use this scanning of documents. Like when we want to onboard for, for a customer, we can scan your passport, mm. read the passport to make you've got the path, make sure you've got the passport. 
We can say, hey, log in at your bank if we need that. If you're trying to recover an account, um, today in healthcare in Canada, very secure infrastructure and they're worried about who sees your health records because that's kind of the holy grail. Of course. But the recovery for a health record password is, hey, send me an email and I'll send you a link to recover it. <laughs> and that kind of means if someone gets into my mom's Hotmail account, that they're yeah. into all of her medical records. Indeed. I think that's ridiculous, right? If you want to yeah. recover the step up I talk about, hey, log in at your bank and let me check that you've got your phone. Like we yeah. can make recovery, we can make sign up, we can make the step up super secure and super easy for customers. Like we showed during the CERB program, the emergency benefit over COVID, mm -hmm. uh, we added 4 million new customers to the services in a week. Mm. Right, and people signed up, got their benefits, and it was in their account in a couple of days. I'm sorry, this is in Canada. In Canada, right? So the yeah. emergency benefit, you could show up at government, you log in at yeah. your bank, um, say I need the benefit, and boom, they push the benefit to you within two days. Yeah, whereas in, in the US, there were lots of checks sent out, and a number of them ended up with uh, deceased persons. Yeah, it's, so there's a lot of complications in how you do all these things, but I think that the combination of powers, like people who have done this before, some of the concepts that were in the bank ID stuff from the Nordics, hmm. some of the concepts like we're using the blockchain and verifiable credentials just to make sure we've got a record that you actually consented to this. All of these systems are putting the customer in the middle. I consent to share my data to this place. And a lot of the concepts are all quite similar. Mm -hmm. I think where they come together, Tony, is around this verifiable credential piece. Yes. And a little bit using the diff capabilities that Microsoft has. So this standard stuff is still going to be a little while till it settles down. Yeah. But the stuff we're building, we call Trust Block on top of Aries, which is this open source platform, we think is the right platform because it can support the Microsoft stuff. It can support um, the W3C verifiable credential. And we're showing interoperability with four different vendors in the US and we're showing it in different places in the world. But the notion of having multiple things, that it's not, digital identity is such a funny term, right? It's, we're just putting <laughs> the ability for people to consent to the sharing of their data. Yeah. I want to share my health records with this doctor, or I want to be able to see my test results for COVID, or I want to be able to do other things. I have to prove it's really me. And how do I do that in an efficient path? How do I do it in an efficient Indeed. process? I think we're learning how to do that well. So Greg, it's been fascinating to hear from a company that's at the forefront of these developments and my final question is if I can kind of like tap into your your thoughtful brain for a second is um, your reflections on COVID you know everyone says that COVID will lead to a more digital society um, but I'm wondering whether a more digital society will be a safer society will be a more equal society does it not have the potential to lose some people, leave some people behind and be slightly exclusionary? So, you know, what, what are your thoughts on um, how society might change as, as a result of COVID and what role can digital ID play in, in what comes next? Yeah, so I, I think processes have to be in place to handle everybody. Like Canada is a very inclusionary place. We want to make sure everybody's in, that you can access these services from a computer in a public library that you can access from your smartphone, you can access from a tablet. Yes. So we have to make sure we can make access as broad uh, as it can be. Um, but at the same time, I don't think the old ways were going back to so quickly. People aren't mm. comfortable walking into a hospital to show a health card to prove it's them, to get a pin number to go home to then create an account, right? If I can mm. remotely prove it's me, I have this health card, I've logged in at my bank, it's me, then I should be able to access my health records without having to drive downtown park, take yeah. my car and do that. Um, if I want to be able to recover an account, I should be able to do it securely. Um, people aren't even comfortable. I want to walk into a bank branch to open an account. If I can scan a document and check my phone and do these other things remotely, we think that's a better model. And we think you're going to see a lot of drop off of people being uncomfortable the same way we're uncomfortable going into restaurants and other things. Can I do it remotely? Do I have to go in in person? Like the stuff that excites us is this empowerment of the individual to consent to sharing and having this range of data that's ours anyway that we should be able to share. I should be able to share my credit file uh, to a place I want to share. If I'm renting an apartment, I should be able to share my credits over 650. I don't have to give them my whole file so they can mm. put it in the desk drawer to sit there, right? This minimize, minimizing data. Yeah. Um, I think there's so many opportunities here that really puts the consumer in the driver's seat. And what I love, what the FIs are doing in Canada is they're saying, hey, we want to help empower that for our customers and make their lives better. And we'll be part of that. So I love the uh, yeah how that works.
Well, I certainly do agree with you that digital identity is going to be one of the foundational building blocks of a more digital future. And uh, again, I think also you're, you're right that there are ways of making that inclusive for people. So um, thank you very much for sharing your, your deep insights. And um, I always think hats off to the entrepreneur who build th who've built things. And you've obviously built a great company in security. You're having tremendous success. And I wish you every success in the future. Thank you, thank Greg. Really appreciate you having us on. Thank you so much. Thank you.